Camping is something that I personally love to do. Unfortunately, this year, Hurricane Ian kinda ruined my camping plans, but hopefully I'll be able to salvage them before it gets too cold. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the reddit r slash thedarkswamp. Be sure to drop an elbow on that like button like Randy Savage, subscribe if you're new, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Hey everyone, before we get into these stories, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder about the horror app I'm partnered with, Chilling. They are currently running an investment campaign for people who want to own a piece of the company. Chilling 2.0 is currently in development, and next year when it launches, in addition to the scary stories, Chilling will be featuring horror movies, shows, short horror films, and Chilling Originals. Chilling is growing so fast, and now it's time for you to get in on the ground floor. I'll leave the link in the description so you can check it out and learn all about Chilling 2.0 and your opportunity. On top of this news, Chilling is always doing fantastic giveaways, and currently for the month of October, they are giving away a PS5 bundle that includes the disc version console, two games, and some Chilling merch. Click the link in the description to learn how you can win. Best of luck, Swamp Folk. I messed with something I shouldn't have, and now it's ruining my life. Bye, Baba Yaga. I can't remember exactly when everything started to happen. I guess it would have begun sometime around the camping trip if I really had to pinpoint it. Camping has always been a tradition for my mates and me. Since we first became friends, we've set some time once a month to head up to our favorite spot, camp, drink, and have a total blast. The drive up was pretty standard. We were all stoked to be back. I noticed something strange when I finally turned on the driveway to our spot there were a variety of dead animals littering the ground. I know, it's cliche, and we should have definitely left immediately, but we are very critical of our memories. Would you stop doing something that you looked forward to every single month over some dead animals in a forest? And the weirdest part was that there wasn't a single sound in the woods. Not a single bird or chime of a bug. No wind either. It was like the whole place was dead or something. I'm not stupid. Or at least, uh, I thought I wasn't. When the forest is silent like this, it only means one thing. There's a predator that's lurking around. I called my colleagues who were behind and told them the situation. Once again, we loved camping, so it was a no-brainer to continue our tradition. But as a precaution, we agreed to keep our guns on our persons. We finally arrived at the site, and we were dumbfounded. The place was absolutely trashed. Ripped up paper, plastic was everywhere, clothing as well, and in the dead middle was this weird, like, shrine. There were burned candles placed all around the ground around this log, and on this log sat this mid-sized statue. Next to the sculpture were four handmade creepy dream catchers. It was like someone was out here worshipping this thing. I was beyond mad. This was our property someone had messed with and we had lived our whole life growing up here. No, I, I was not letting someone trash this place and put this stupid thing here. I picked up a thick branch and smashed it into bits. I grabbed all the trash, I put it into a pile, and lit that crap all on fire. Right when the fire was lit, I noticed the forest went back to its busy noises. The birds were chirping, and the bugs were making their normal noise. Even the wind was back. Later that night, we forgot about the creepy shrine and the trash, we were midway through our beers and s'mores when we heard a loud metallic scratching noise coming from where our cars were parked. Right after that, all of our car alarms went off. We loaded our rifles and went to check them out. All of our tires were slashed, if you can call them tires at this point. They were ripped so severely that it was just a mess of rubber. There were also deep slashes on the sides of the trucks. And then the forest went quiet again. We luckily had enough service to contact the ranger's office. During the call, there was a rustle to our left. With the combined anxiety and beer, we didn't take a chance. Each of us fired off six bullets. Any bear or big cat would have run off at the very least. This thing was still moving around. Bro, what is that? I asked. 
A second later, I heard my voice coming from where we shot at. Bro, what is that? We all looked at each other in terror. It sounded like me, but it was different. How is this possible? My voice came from the forest, but I was standing by the trucks with my friends. That's impossible. This thing kept repeating the things I had spoken all night in my authentic voice with that slight distortion. We didn't care about the trucks as we all ran down the driveway. A couple of minutes later, and the forest noise was back. We were in the clear. I had never been so happy to hear a cricket in my life. We later ran into some rangers, and we got a lift home. Of course, we didn't mention the voice, but we told them about the animal and what it did to our car. They told us it was likely a massive, ticked-off bear. <laughs> if only they knew. A couple of days later, some quote-unquote stuff started happening. Knocks at my doors and windows at odd hours of nights persisted for about a week. Normal, right? I mean, probably a bunch of teenagers playing a dumb prank or something. I put this to the back of my head and reassured myself that they would eventually get bored. A couple of days later, I threw the idea entirely out the window. Covering the ground was a mixture of dead animals. What the heck? I thought. No teenager would take it this far. I knew whatever that thing from the mountain was had followed me home. I went out and purchased a camera system and hooked it up. That night I sat in my living room holding my rifle acting as if it would do anything at all. I heard a hard knock at the door. When I looked out I saw a figure standing on the pathway. It was hard to see as it was dark outside but I knew it was that thing from the mountain. In the same voice it called out to me. Hey, could you open the door? It's freezing out here. What the heck? What is this and what does it want? Get the hell away from me! I yelled. Get the hell away from me! It answered back, again my voice, but much more distorted. I can't even lie. All of my courage drained at that moment. I'm not scared to admit it. I was crying as I phoned the police. By the time the police arrived, it was of course gone. Luckily, I still had the camera though. I gave them the footage and they said they would look into it. In the following weeks, I noticed that things had started to follow me. Out of the corner of my eye, I would catch a figure wearing a hood, and as soon as I turned my head to look at it, it would disappear like it was never there. I know I was not imagining it, and I also knew I wouldn't hide for much longer as it was starting to get bold, and I was right. One night, I was walking to my car, and as I was about to get in, I was pushed hard to the ground. Looking down at me, in the same voice, it calmly said, Let's see how far we take this game. Wait, please, I said in fear. Leave me alone, I didn't mean to mess with you. We're just getting started. It whispered back to me. When it took off its hood, I couldn't believe it. I it was me. It looked exactly like me. Same eyes and mouth and the same scar on my left cheek and the same hair. It was like I was looking into a mirror. And to top it off, it already had my voice. I'll see you around. It said as it gave me a wink and walked away. The next day, I knew something was wrong when I woke up to see more than 100 notifications on my phone. This thing had made videos with my full name saying awful things, racial slurs, and how I was going to shoot up buildings. Videos of me saying I hated my family and how I wanted to kill all of my friends and much more. Remember, it looked and sounded exactly like me and used my real name. It seemed that only I was the one that would hear the distortion in the voice. All the notifications were from my family and friends outraged at what this thing had said, thinking it was me. I liked this girl and we had seen each other for a while. She stated I had done and said some very disgusting and hateful things about her all morning and that we were done together. What was I even supposed to say? Something has taken my face and voice and is ruining my life. Later in the day I received a text from my bank, not social media, that my transactions was complete. No freaking way, I whispered. It had emptied my entire bank account. I quickly called and told them I did not make this transaction, but they said I had walked in and done it. While on the phone in the bank, I heard some commotion outside. I looked outside the window, expecting to see the figure I had grown to hate. What seemed to be the whole police force surrounded my house with their guns drawn. I was instructed to step out slowly and lay on the ground with my hands on my head, and I was arrested on the spot. I was told I was being charged with the robbery and three murder charges. It took a little for the details to come out. But they said I walked into a store, robbed it, and shot up the store before fleeing. Three people were killed, and four people were in critical condition. I told my lawyer that I didn't own that type of firearm, and they made a mistake. 
He told me they found the money from the bank transaction in the stolen amount. Plus, the gun used in the crime was stashed in my shed. I told him about the dead animals. That's not normal, I asked. Is it? They all had knife marks on their body, he answered. And guess what they found in your trash can? A knife matching the animal's blood. What about my friends? I asked. They were all there. They were all brought in for questioning. He said with a cold-faced tone. And they said some very bad things. I was practically falling out of my chair at this point. They said no voices came from the woods and that it was just a big bear. No, no, no. We all heard it. What about the cameras? I screamed. I gave the cameras to the police and it would show the figure. My lawyer shook his head. From our view, there was no one in sight. Plus, the cameras picked up no sound. My lawyer told me I was screwed and three witnesses saw my face. What was posted on social media that morning didn't help me either. On the first day of court, I was immediately charged with grand robbery, three accounts of murder, and four accounts of attempted murder, with more charges on the side. I was given five life sentences and no chance of parole. I had to be isolated because of my so-called dangerous behavior and was forced to talk to a psychiatrist. She of course told me it was all in my head. She tried to force me to believe that there was no shape-shifting creature that had ruined my life, and I had a bad mental breakdown. She said it was normal behavior to blame someone else for what I had done. I don't know who to trust. I think the psychiatrist is the shapeshifter and is trying to ruin my mental mind. It probably messed with my friends too, because we all heard the voices. They can't lie to me anymore. I'm staring at the makeshift noose I tied as I type this. I'm done with the pain this thing caused me. In only a couple of weeks, this thing has ruined any relationship I had with my friends and family, emptied all my funds, and managed to commit a crime and blame it all on me. I'm not giving this thing the fun and satisfaction of its continuous attempts to ruin me. We encountered something weird while camping. By Colton. Howdy Swamp, it's Colton, and I've come today to share my cryptid encounter. I believe my cousin and I got extremely close to a cryptid known as a crawler. For a long time, my cousin and I, whom I'll refer to as Evan, had no idea what we saw. But we are 110% positive we saw something. We were camping with our families when our dads, my dad, and uncle said we should go for a snipe hunt. Now, a few of you should understand that this is a relatively old practical joke for kids. Pretending to catch a bird called a snipe often results in someone jumping into a cow pie after someone makes them think there's a bird there. Evan and I were like six to nine, somewhere around that age range. We were fairly young, so we went along excitedly, even though Evan did despite not being a very outdoorsy person. Our dads took us out into the woods, not far from the camp, but a little ways away. Then we curled up in a bush and waited. Our dads left us with that light and told us not to move until they came with the bird. And then we'd jump out and catch it. We sat perfectly still, not even whispering because we were that excited. Then suddenly something landed right beside our bush. Evan whispered, What was that? I cut him off with a finger to my lips and motioned to my ear to listen. At that moment we heard something coming from the bush. No noticeable patterns to the steps. I just knew it wasn't a person. After sitting there for just a second, I heard it get so close I swear I heard it breathing. My cousin and I held our breath, not trying to make a sound at all. I strained my eyes to see anything through the dark, then through the leaves of the bush. The moonlight revealed a white mass walking around the bush. It was circling us. I grabbed my cousin's shoulder and tensed up, ready to run. Just then it bolted away and I saw the lights of the flashlights and heard my dad's voice. I breathed deeply, sighed in relief, and waited, and freaked out when they returned to us. Of course, with no bird. At first, my cousin and I just said that a bobcat or a raccoon was coming too close to us, but now I'm not as sure. The white skin, the speed, the circling. It may not have been hunting us, but if it were, this story would have probably ended differently. But it was definitely curious. I don't know. What do you all think in the comments below? Turongo Falls Camping Horror by Taj I went on a camping trip to Turongo Falls, Victoria, Australia. Now, a quick layout of the place. 
There are two huge hills on either side of the campgrounds with the campgrounds in the middle. On the first night, we went hiking in both mountains. And yeah, I say we because I was with two of my cousins and two of my brothers. On day one, we decided to hike up both hills, the taller hill first. Not all the way but high enough to find a good spot for a fire that wasn't entirely on an angle. It would be easier because the only plants would be brush and some ferns. But we had to climb on a fall but we had to climb over a fallen tree to get across to the other side of the river, which the shorter but more dense hill didn't have. Anyway, we hiked up through the ferns trying to mark the trees with our park trying to mark the trees with our pocket knife so we would have a good way back. So we find a good spot for a small fire, light it for a little bit and chat before getting super hungry and deciding it's time to go back. It takes maybe 20 minutes. We follow the makeshift markings, making our way back and climbing across the fallen tree. Our camp is just there. We eat, drink, and whatnot before going on to the shorter, more dense second hill. This had to have been one of the worst decisions of my life. We crossed a road and started going up. At first, it was just ferns, but then it quickly turned into some more dense, swampy jungle that became tormentingly repetitive and brutal. We were looking for just a small clearing for a small campfire and to sit and rest for a bit. But after about an hour of hiking up, I just kind of gave up and realized this wasn't somewhere we should have been going further upwards. It would be fruitless to continue. So after a debate with my brothers and cousins, we started to turn around. This is where things take a turn for the worst. After a couple of minutes in on the way down, we came across some sort of slight cliff or slope that we didn't come up from. We didn't recognize it. It sounds like there's almost a waterfall at the bottom. We could not see because it was dark at this point. This is when I start freaking out in my head, coming to the realization that we had all become lost on a muddy, swampy, jungle-like hill. And mind you, as I said before, we hiked about an hour up this hill. So we are easily hundreds of meters up. We all hit our panic and went up a little bit and turned left. After that, we walked over this hill for two plus hours before finally finding a small river that could lead us to the bottom. We follow it for maybe 10 minutes before I see a flat dirt clearing, like it was a mini fishing spot or something. We decided to go across the small river and walk up a bit to check it out. Mind you, the whole time my group yelled at me to come back, and I'm glad I ignored them because the spot I had crossed over led to a dirt road. I had never felt so relieved before. I quickly screamed to everyone about my findings, and sure enough, after about a minute or two, we had come across a gate at the bottom of the hill, and we were now back at the camping area, all because of me. Imagine if I had listened to my group, ditched what I had found, and came back across the river. Now it gets even weirder, I kid you not. Not even a couple of minutes later that same night, as we were all muddy and sitting by the campfire, we all had seen what looked to be a UFO in the sky. My brother pointed up and said, the stars are moving kind of funny. At first, I laughed and didn't think anything of it. Still, he said, no, really, look, dude. My cousin said, yeah, the stars have been moving. So I almost broke my neck as I jerked upwards to see a freaking star spinning around in circles before shooting off into a straight line. It wasn't the only star to do that either. There was multiple of them, all in one night. And this wasn't the first time I've seen quote-unquote aliens, but that's just a story for another time. On the second night, we went across the river to our campfire spot to a more accessible hill, which only had soft ferns. Still, I was almost traumatized from the previous night. We went up and cooked some potatoes and tinfoil without incident, and that's all I can really remember. Thanks for reading my story. Camping in Romania by Anonymous this is going to be a relatively long camping story told by someone who doesn't speak English as a native language, so be understanding. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such. So, yeah. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and against the idea of camping. I had to lie to them and say that we would stay in a hotel near the Cozia National Park so they would get off my back. That's not what we did. Okay. So long story short, we had to travel from Bucharest to the park, which is around a 200 kilometer drive, about two hours by train. We got our big backpacks and everything we needed and went our way. Nothing specifically happened on the train except for the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. 
I got excited thinking that we have the whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it is scarce, and of course, after 10 to 20 minutes, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those who usually don't like people. Not this dog, though. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed as if he were a stuffed animal himself. He would listen to the owner's every single command. I was impressed, so I asked the man about his dog since it would be a long and awkward trip in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog except for the commands he would give to his dog. No other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is Yuchigushu, which is Romanian for the killer. I thought it was a weird name to give a dog, but I thought to each their own. I asked him why he had such a scary name and he said, This dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and he is good at it. Now I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have a similar personality to his owner, and most of the time I would judge people with dogs and how that animal reacts to the world and his owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe at all. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy was training his dog to hunt in the woods. Then I started thinking about which woods are legal to hunt in our country. While thinking of that, the guy out of nowhere asked us if we are traveling to the Kozia National Park. That was surprisingly accurate, considering the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and long before we even met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing because in my country, people happen to go in the same direction. We'll try to make small talk and guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination or be honest if you want. Unfortunately, I took the honest route, and I'm judging myself for that hardly. Never be too open with strangers or honest after reading this story. It should be a warning. We confirmed we were going to the Kozia National Park and asked what else there was to see around there since he started talking about the area nicely considering we knew nothing about the site. We took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, and the animals we could encounter. He told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we had to climb. He also advised us to check out the Lotree Shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and try out the local restaurants. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud clink sound. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination and said our goodbyes. The man waved at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turned around back right away because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was and the man and dog were no longer there. Just like that, they were gone. That creeped me out a bit. We were too thrilled about the first camping experience to care though, so we started walking with our backpacks, 10 kilograms each, and we reached a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during the night, would make your hair stand straight. Luckily for me, we traveled during daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end, but by the time we got to the middle of it, we heard a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stop and my boyfriend looks at me with this, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog, I go right towards the sound, and in the middle of the road I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles around its butt crying so hard, laying on the cement as if it were hit by a car. I freeze and think our trip is over. I must save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears, gets up, and like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. About a kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone threw her in the river to kill her, all wet, cold, and hungry. Of course, we take her too. So here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks, each two puppies at our chest, a boyfriend with a map, and still trying to find a spot to camp for the night. We passed by the monastery the man on the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priest would not allow us. So we just walked around the property through the gardens until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second you put them down to force them to walk on their own, 
they would slam their butts on the ground and cry. So much drama. We walked and walked and walked until we decided to stop because it was getting late and I was beginning to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark cottage in the middle of the woods. We call it Troyanitsa. It's like a scouting post but for the church where they place religious icons or a bible. Inside to bring good energy to the area, it belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house and it has a roof with four small walls and an opening, not quite a door. You could go into it to hide from the rain, but it really wasn't meant for that. There was an icon inside and a bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible and was annoyed to see people would write down their names in it as couples do on trees. But on one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably somebody who wanted to scare travelers with a silly message. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, made the fire, unpacked, and made food to eat. We feed the puppies which are now cuddled up in our tent, and finally darkness starts to rise around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer than they were in reality. Now it's midnight and we are all in the tent cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up to unzip the tent and let them out to pee. They do and I get them back in, they call some more, and the smallest one starts shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is now up as well, and he hears it. The fire is fading. The sound disappears into the woods when he unzips the tent and steps out. It sounded like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, what was that, a snake? He says up to this day he cannot explain what he saw. He said it was a slithery figure with feet that made a sort of snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature runs into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's around 3am this time when we wake up to the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead. We have no idea how to put up a sustaining fire apparently. My boyfriend gets up and searches for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness and swear to god I hear whispers between the trees. I look up at the sky considering it's 3am and listen to birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now I'm no expert on birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these birds weren't, they were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated about something. I look at the fire, follow the red sparks popping out into the sky and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die, it goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary because it created an illusion that was hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, making a track for me, probably to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burned out and none of them ever did. They would levitate, turn green and flow off into the woods. At that moment I begin to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds are agitated, the mysterious light pointing us deeper into the woods and all the trees around us have eyes on them like the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked precisely like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes form when a branch is ripped from the root, which is the shape left after. But there were so many, like hundreds of eyes, all looking at the exact same spot where we decided to camp. Having only that religious tiny landmark to protect us mentally, and as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, only about 10 meters away from us. I stand my ground but don't go near it. Suddenly a dark, bent over silhouette comes out and half inside the bush and half outside, staring at us. I call my boyfriend and we're both like, what is that? Is it a bear cub, a wolf, a pig? The creature shakes its head the same way a dog does after a bath and I hear a distinguished clink like a dog collar. At this time my boyfriend manages to light up a fire massively, lighting up much of the area. Apparently, it also scares this animal to run back into the woods through the bush. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again that night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep and the puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open just a little, just enough to have an eye peek through it. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep. Suddenly, I hear a noise coming from that direction and I immediately wake my boyfriend up who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts my dreams. From that same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking toward our tent. 
Note that our peeping hole was small enough not to make it look like you were being watched inside the tent. His head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, an entire torso, and a leg. Bit by bit, as a whole man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted by the moon in our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This is all happening at like 2 to 3 a.m., a couple of feet in front of our tent. I look at this man in horror because I recognize him, and now the clink I heard earlier from the animal is explained. It is the same man from the train, with his dog, too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us, but this guy was there since midnight at least. Because our fire would be dead every two to three hours, the sound of cracked branches would wake us up and rocks being moved, which we internally explained to some animals crossing the land. After successfully putting out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging in it bit by bit, until only his head would be out, with a disfigured looking mouth looking like a moaning ghost. You try to go back to sleep after that, I bet you you can't do it either. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, lit ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit I fell asleep while sitting next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up immediately. I was far too scared to go near that bush, but I did not need any answers or any explanations. I was not curious to find out what that person was doing. The moment the sun rose, we packed all of our stuff and got the hell out of there. We planned a four-day camping trip, but this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that guy followed us or it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin it all. I don't know what they were doing. As a conclusion to my story and a piece of advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination to strangers. You don't know where their minds may take them and what they may end up doing. Always stay safe and always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that may come to you in the form of sounds, movement changes, and temperature, and so on. Always protect yourself. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or r slash thedarkswamp on Reddit. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Don't forget to strangle that like button as if it owes you money, and don't forget to punch that subscribe button so it turns red and sore. I upload brand new videos almost every single day, and you're not going to want to miss out on all I have coming up. If you're on the go but want to download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories and listen to them wherever you are, even without data, you can download them absolutely free from YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Be sure to comment down below what story was your favorite tonight. If you made it all the way to the end, comment the code word Jumping Leprechaun. I would love to see how many many people actually make it to the end. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you soon with another creepy video.